All right, I hope everyone enjoyed that video. That's good. Yeah, really well. Our next talk is going to be Mr. Charles Beans. I'm so happy to introduce him because he graduated in the same field that I am pursuing at the moment. Uh, after graduating from the U.S. Air Force Academy with degrees in engineering, mechanics, and material science, then earning a master's degree from John Hopkins University in mechanical engineering and another master's degree from the National War College in National Security Strategy, Charles Beams played his talents to work for 30 years within the new space industry. Before coming to Seattle and leading Paul Allen Space Company, he provided acquisition and technical oversight of a $90 billion space portfolio, restructuring space launch acquisitions to ensure a more competitive and commercially viable industry, while overseeing the acquisition of restructuring of the GPS and communication satellite architectures to ensure future operating stability. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Charles Mears. Very much for the introduction, and I just uh, just want to say good morning to, to everybody and welcome to Seattle, the 21st century hub of innovation. I think it's uh, I moved here uh, coming up on three years ago, and uh, and the thing that has struck me the most about Seattle is the most surprising. I had no idea what a what an incredibly deep entrepreneurial, innovative culture we have here in Seattle. I've, I've, I've just fallen in love with it. I mean, it's everything from the tech, obviously, that people are familiar with, with Microsoft and, and everybody else. Um, retail, you know, I mean, obviously, Amazon's huge. But remember that if Nordstrom's came here, right? And Nordstrom's has reinvented retail and continues to do that as well. And, and so it, it's a fascinating music culture. And, and now, we talked a little bit about space. I can sort of hear it and sort of not. I think I'll stay here. So I, I, uh, I wanted to take, first of all, it, it, it's an honor. I want to thank uh, the Space Frontier Foundation for uh, Inviting me to speak, it's, it's a real honor to, to be able to talk with um, the folks here today. The uh, it's, it, it it really I'm, I'm sort of humbled. I mean, this is an amazing crowd. Like Jeff said earlier, of, of entrepreneurs, just people really excited about the space business. And and I want I'm you know I'm learning as much as 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 anybody else coming here. And so. What I'm going to do is, I think they have scheduled about 30 minutes for my uh, for my keynote. I'm going to I'm going to keep keep it so we're trying to keep it about 20 25 minutes at the most because I really am hoping that I can get some questions, um, some really tough questions, especially from from all the uh, the introverted shy engineers that actually are, are sitting in their seats and they have really great questions to ask and are, and are kind of afraid to. So those are the people I really want to get questions from. Um, you know, for a long time now, um, Paul and the whole Vulcan team has been has been taking on and addressing um, some of the toughest challenges of our time. Uh, every, you know, these, the, what he calls the hardest problems: brain science, um, artificial intelligence, trying to invent smart cities of the future. And then, you know, and then recently, uh, infectious disease with the, the whole Vulcan. And space access is another one of those really, really tough problems. Uh, it's been, it's, it's, uh, and there's lots of folks. It's an exciting time now. There's lots of folks that are, that are uh, investing in it and, 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 and doing all kinds of interesting approaches. We just saw the, the video of those Blue Origins work, which is amazing and brilliant. And we, as a nation, are very proud of it. Um, and uh, so. What Paul did was he said, you know, he started up the, the Strata Launch project back in 2011, and things were going well, and, and so he said, you know, I want to create a, uh, 
a division within Vulcan that is dedicated to this purpose of, of learning from completing the strata launch project, learning from that, figuring out how we can we can help lead like, like all the other folks that are, that are doing it in, in revolutionizing space access. And um, so we did that, and our aim is really about that, and it's specifically focused, and this is why I'm so excited to talk to this group, it's really specifically focused on the entrepreneur. The whole point of announcements that will be coming shortly of partnerships and all that is at its core, it's all about enabling access to the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur that wants to create a business, the entrepreneur that has, has an idea to solve a really tough problem. And, and I'll get into that a little bit more in, in a second, but and there, there's a reason why we're focusing on the entrepreneur, and it's because of what I see, what Paul and I see, is the, the sort of mega trend going on. As, as a lot of folks know, Vulcan's also an investment company. So we're invested in a lot of a lot of the companies here today. And you know, the investment community is its own kind of thing. You know, we, we talk a lot, we trade notes, and, and one of the things I see going on is that what began with uh, it really kind of began before the X Prize, the Ansari X Prize. But, but, but the, you know, the Bert and Paul winning the X Prize they really added fuel to that, that fire. And, and the new space movement really took off. And it's, an it's been an exciting time. Lots of, lots of money, lots of people that, that uh, made lots of money in the, in the tech sector were uh, interested in, they're still just highly creative individuals and were very interested in, in exploring and seeing what could be done in the space sector. But what we're seeing on the investment side is that we're becoming more and more focused on, you know, I guess, uh, a trend going from the kind of what, what I say, what I call is cool, which is a lot of these interesting, the, the, the early new space stuff, hey, let's try this, let's try that, to good business plans, sound investments, and, and the discipline associated with that. What it means is that the sort of the basic laws of economics that we, we learned in college, we all had to take, you know, micro and macroeconomic, supply and demand, real business plans, real estimates of return on investment, all that kind of stuff is, is coming to the forefront and it is it is a is a key piece of the decision making for going forward. Realizing that is what has helped us to shift our focus and emphasis in the in what we call this future we call next space. That's just our name for what we was just going on. That is the trend that's where everything's headed. And it is that the, the laws of economics that apply to everybody here and their in regular commerce are beginning to apply to lower orbit. And, um, and that's an exciting time. And so if we, along with everybody else that's involved in space access, are able to provide more convenient, i.e., not waiting so long to get on to get on orbit for for your payloads, especially the entrepreneur, the startup that wants to build the three or the six U satellite, get it launched, and then to raise the confidence in investors to do uh, a Series A or a seed round of investment. They can do that without having to wait two years, because in two, you know, for for a ride potentially. Because two years is critical. Keeping a team together, keeping the burial two men in the garage together for two years for the deployment of two people, that's a long time to gain salary without being able to generate either generate revenue or to raise equity. And the equity, the, the, the private equity markets are tight. And, uh, and so we see it as critically important to the, the continued success of the new space movement that we, that we 
get there. Also, community access and also low cost. So that's that's kind of the that's the backdrop. That's that's where we see things going in the future. That's the, the capital markets, the technology. Obviously, Moore's law continues unabated. Satellites are getting smaller and more and more capable every month, every six months. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll put in that shameless plug for, for a black sky since, you know, they're, they're a company near dear to my heart. But, but there's, there's hundreds of them out there that are, that are building these satellites that are incredibly small. Because as I said in my intro, I've been, I've been in this racket a while, not in, not in the new space for 30 years, but I've been in the space business a long time on the system side. And uh, it is staggering what we're able to do with very small satellites. So how are we doing that? Well, the Stratoline aircraft, that was, was a little bit of media coverage about it the other day, um, it's our, really our first step. And um, what does that mean? That means that we'll have a mobile range. It'll be able to uh, fly, you can see in, the, in the, the graphic, fly up to about 30, 35,000 feet, release its rocket, return back to the runway, and load another rocket up. So we, we're moving, we want to move toward airport style operations. A very, what a very large aircraft does, it allows us to serve not just the very small client base, but really everything from the, the, the tiniest of tiny satellites all the way up to medium class. And that's, that's a really exciting, really exciting opportunity. What that'll mean is that when we're operational, it'll mean that, that this weight that I talked about will be measured in weeks instead of years, but especially for that entrepreneur. And that's, that's important. Maybe it's the entrepreneur that wants to get their first satellite up. Maybe it's you know, more of a venture type. Or maybe it's they, they've done their Series A and they want to they want to show because a lot of this, these new constellations it's about a network. They need to put up a partial constellation, you know, a little bit more capable. So, so all those sort of classes of satellites are what we're, we're aiming to serve. What does this what does this really mean? It means that really kind of for the first time, launch the launch business will be dedicated and tailored to the customer. The, the customer won't have to figure out, oh, how am I going to make this work? The idea is that they'll come and they'll say, this is what we need to get, well, this is what we need to get to orbit. And, and this is when we need it, and this is where we need it. And when we're fully operational, that's what we'll be able to offer. And, and it's all about about the folks that want to solve problems, the entrepreneurs that want to solve problems and, and build great businesses, or they want to take on challenges, or, or whatever. We will soon, as I mentioned, we'll soon be announcing um, our initial wave of partners. And I, and I thought I would take, a, take the opportunity for a second to, to kind of explain what I mean by a partnership. You know, a partnership sometimes is used as a polite, kind of a polite term, politically correct term or whatever for a supplier or vendor. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about partnerships that are more like domestic partnerships. They're more, they're more along the lines of, we're both in this together in some fashion, right? We, we, will, we, will, we will succeed or we'll fail together. Those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of partnerships we're seeking. Because of that, it's a little different than, than the conventional supplier thing. And, and um, so we're, we're kind of inventing something new here. And we're, we're sorting through the details of that. That's, so there'll be lots, lots of announcements coming in the, uh, in the, in the very, near, very near future. But 
I wanted to kind of, uh, and I'm happy to take questions about that, but the, um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about the customers. You know, the, the, the world is advancing quickly. Um, as my tech friends remind me, you know, Moore's Law is continuous. It's, it's, it's uncanny what we're going to be able to do. And, the, and everything in the second days from that machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the domain, the space domain is just another domain around which we'll be able to operate and do amazing things to make life better here on Earth. And we need to be ready for that. Again, to, to address a question I had gotten uh, months ago about, you know, why start with the aircraft? We started with the aircraft because we built the biggest aircraft we could because that gave us the most flexibility. Because if there's one thing we know about the future is that we really don't know what the future is going to be, except it's going to be very exciting and it's going to be highly innovative. So we're determined to solve this challenge of access to space along with everybody else. We're not, we're not going along here. We have one solution. There's lots of brilliant companies out there that are doing amazing things. And some of them are going to be on stage with the panel early or later after, after this uh, little talk. But um, the, the, the other thing, the other point I wanted to make, um, you know, I talked about how Paul is, is he's defined his life by taking on tough challenges, things that will change and improve the lives of the world, frankly. And the interesting thing about this challenge that we're taking on is that what it will enable, it's, it's a big part of the legacy, because it will enable future mavericks, people that want to take on the big challenges. It'll allow them greater access to space. So that space is one of the tools in their toolbox when they're taking, when they're trying to solve things like climate change, clean oceans, all these these great challenges that are local, frankly, and they're really tough. And then, and you know, there's people people like us that are working on them hard right now. But I think that the the, the real solutions these are going to be coming from the next generation. Some of them I'm looking at in the audience like thirty. That's you. And then and there's some that are probably in high school that they grew up with you know computers in their hands, not not uh, right like the folks here. Fine. Um, not like me that learned how to program on a computer on a Burroughs B2900 mainframe computer. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, so that's you know, a couple of challenges along the lines of like the, the, the ocean health. The things, these are things that are important to Paul in anti poaching, right? That's a big deal. Um, also allow for more efficient use. A lot of the remote sensing technologies will allow for much more efficient use of our precious resources, whether it's, whether it's just water itself or, or um, mining of the resources. We'll be able to, with spectral sensing and those kinds of things, we'll be able to more efficiently use our planet and not waste. Because as the, as the population gets bigger, that's, that's an important thing. And it's, it's a tough problem. And personally, I believe that, that the um, space and the aerospace industry has an important role to play in that. And finally, I saw some uh, some uniform people uh, walking around. I think General Armani is, is in the audience. And I wanted to I wanted to uh, talk. I have, I have a little bit of a background in the uh, in the defense business, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that very quickly. But it's an important thing to think about, and there's many components to it. I'm just going to address just one or two. The, the, space, the space business is an interesting one because it's kind of the last of the industries to really emerge out of the kind of Cold War economy, the planned economy. And because of that, it's probably the last one of the, of the types of warfare to, to kind of advance into, the, into this into a more a less of a bipolar thing and more into a who knows what's going on up there kind of world. And I mention that because if you look at the evolution of land and sea forces, and they've gone to smaller teams, 
teams and more agile and have to be more responsive. And then you listen to what General Hayden has been talking about, and this is amazing for people that have no background in national security stuff. He's talking public, he's the four-star general, the head of all of this, the Air Force space stuff, and he's talking about how dangerous it is up there now. We have, it's, it's, a, it's, it's getting pretty scary up there. There's, you know, there's threats to things that are very important, very near and dear to our way of life. I believe that the technologies, the responsiveness, the small satellites, all that technology is going to be a key piece in helping this country, the response of all, in, in helping this country for its defense. Um, much like it'll be, I, I believe it'll be something akin to a lot of the special teams and, and all that kind of stuff that, is, that we do um, for the land and department for sea force. So I just wanted to say that because it's an important, uh, important thing to think about. Just because we're in space doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't be thinking about, about the, the, the important contributions we can make to our nation's defense. So, again, I, I really want to open this thing up to questions, but I'll, I just wanted to uh, finish with this. You know, I talked about where we believe the economy is moving towards, right? Whether we things have a course that we can't really affect much. And one of those is that a lot of the, the capital that was that was really flowing heavily into the space, this new space arena, I think you're going to start to see it not shut down, but it's going to begin to slowly kind of retract. You're going to see VCs, you're going to see the high net worth people becoming more and more steely-eyed about the investments they make. Steely-eyed from the standpoint of looking at real business plans, looking at what's the return on investment. Still, they still want to make big bets, but you're going to see that trend. Just as the PC revolution put computing power into the hands of millions and forever changed the world, something my boss had a little bit to do with, we believe the convenient and affordable access to low work and orbit has the potential to radically improve how we live and work. And that our goal at Vulcan Aerospace is to help make that a reality. And so I'm, I, I'm eager to, um, to take any questions that folks might have about, about my, my thoughts and comments. And, uh, and then, so, anybody have? Sure. If you could, yeah, as long as everyone, make sure people know uh, who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, my name is uh, Nicholas. I just uh, finished my master's degree in Sweden. Uh, so Congratulations. So I have to start, thank you. This sort of um, multinational and dual citizenship, uh, this global sort of viewpoint on, on space, uh, making it cheaper and cheaper to get into lower Earth orbit. Um, Who's, who's going to be, so to say, the authority on, uh, I'll call it space junk removal? Um, you know, for the, you know, your trash collector, yeah. you have the, the United Excellent States, you know, your government to say, okay, we're going to pay your taxes and we'll, so like, there's no, I mean, I Right, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a great question. It, it, the you know, space is kind of a, another global commons, right? And, and so there is a, um, there's a responsibility that we all have. Um, I can tell you that it is a conversation when I was when I was in the Pentagon that was going on then. Um, the Air Force has has has, has kind of taken it, taken it on, but but realistically, this is my personal opinion. Um, we that's a problem we need to solve. Um, I talked to George Neal about it. The Space uh, Foundation has. Uh, working groups on it that we participate in. They're very, very important, and I see it becoming incredibly important in Leo, when we, because in the next 10 years, there are going to be literally thousands and thousands more satellites up there than are currently. And so it's an excellent question, and I can tell you, I don't have an answer beyond that, um, but I think that I would suggest you get, you get involved in those, um, and I'm happy to, to talk with you afterwards if you want to get involved in some of those work, it's, it's very, very important. Doug Messier from parabolicarc.com. Hey. Uh, 
I see you, though. I hear you, but I don't see you. Over oh. there. Oh. oh, there you are. Great. Yeah. You, um, you were at this conference last year yes, in, in July at, uh, in San Jose, and you said that uh, you were expecting to make some announcements on rockets and what you're actually going to use on this airplane and, yeah. in the fall. And um, can you give us an update on when you might be able to make this announcement? And sure. In fact, that was what I was alluding to with the um, yeah. partnerships. Um, we, will, we will be making announcements very, very soon. We were we were anticipating being able to make some announcements um, as a part of this conference, candidly. But we are we're still working through it. Again, when I talk about these partnerships, these are complex things. These are not just the, the, the classic sort of aerospace supplier vendor kind of relationships. And so uh, we're we're working through the details of those. And um, but it'll be we we will uh, it'll be coming soon. And, and it'll be more. And with, with small sets, do you think something this complex and this big with the, you know, competing against the, the whole range of small sat launchers that are being developed? I do, and the reason why is because, remember the aircraft is, is, is it's just a single aircraft. So a, a flight, obviously, we, we would want to be smart about it. We want to burn a bunch of fuel just to launch one picosat, right? But, but it's, it's, it really doesn't cost that much for a flight. Like you fly with the airplane, it's it's six 747 engines for a for a you know a one hour hour and a half flight. What it does bring, though, an interesting sort of aspect to it is for these small sets and the small set revolution. In one flight, we'd be able to put that satellite in precisely the orbit that you want to put it in at precisely the right time. And we'd be able to put many satellites in, in one inclination, in one plane. And if, if the customer, again, get back to this, it's going to be, going to be very tailored to the customer, we will be able to put many multiple satellites into multiple different inclinations all in the same launch. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Just wondering how uh, many flights per week you think you might need to be. $10,000 and $1,000 per kilogram launch It's a good question. I can tell you that we're in the beginning. You know, our, our plan will be to, um, we, we'll want to make sure, safety is the most important thing, right? We want to make sure that, that, that our, our customers have the confidence that we're going to be safe and reliable. Like, like everything else that we've done up to this point, it will be a call, walk, run approach. In the beginning, we'll probably do one a month or maybe every other month because we'll want to be we'll have it heavily instrumented. We'll want to make sure we're collecting lots of data and know exactly what what's going, what the performance is. As we work this out, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to go to a, a one a week. Another question? I'm here. Oh, right. hi. <laughs> How are hi. You? Uh, great, thank you. It's th thanks a lot for great remarks, and I've been copious of taking notes. Uh, you alluded to something around smart cities. I'm really interested around that. And then, how do you envision, given that the number of projects across the world that is investing from an infrastructure standpoint to IoT to networking to sensors and connecting basically your physical geography yeah. to a digital environment? What role does the space industry and your companies look to play to ensure that you're missing that other component, which is going up? Oh, sorry, not to hear your comments. That, that is actually an incredibly brilliant question because that is exactly the kind of thing that I see in the coming in the future. Is and, and, and Paul, Paul, more significantly, Paul does as well, which is that the smart city challenge. That, that and, and that's a, that's another part of Vulcan, frankly, that's running that. So I'll, I'll kind of want to defer to them for the. Details. I know there's a lot going on with that, um, but I can tell you that from a space, from an aerospace perspective, there is a definite role. One of the things um, that I, in some of these talks I give, that it always kind of takes people a step back. But if you really think about um, Uber, it's really a space application. It's very, it's actually a very clever use of the GPS signal, right? And the mapping and the, and, and, and the, and the business maps, that's the real genius. But without GPS, just that, that, that amazing business, that amazing company, 
couldn't exist. Well, imagine, imagine, and that's just, that's just Uber, that's just building, you know, and building a more efficient sort of, frankly, a traffic thing, because I, I, this feature I see in that is it's just incredible. So imagine all the other kinds of applications of, of either passive or active sensing devices that could be in space that could make our lives even more efficient in cities um, and uh, in, in a networked environment. And, and, and um, you know, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, and I, I can't pretend to project all the things that could be done, but there's a lot of people in this audience that can. And, um, and I think with the standardization of uh, networking protocols and all that kind of stuff, I think a lot of these things are just become more and more an app-like environment. And uh, I think it's just going to be, it's, it's one of these things where we haven't seen anything yet. Thank you. Stop. All right. So I'll stop. Thank you very much for your questions. And I uh, look forward to coming. Uh, we're going to try to keep on schedule as best as we can here. I have a few announcements before we uh, continue. Someone, I, I, uh, I wanted to take, first of all, it, it, it's an honor. I want to thank uh, the Space Frontier Foundation for uh, inviting me to speak. It's, it's a real honor to, to be able to talk with um, the folks here today. The uh, it's, it, it, it really, I'm, I'm sort of humbled. I mean, this is an amazing crowd, like Jeff said earlier, of, of entrepreneurs, just people really excited about the space business. And and I want, I'm, you know, I'm learning as much as, as as anybody else coming here. And so what I'm going to do is, I think they have scheduled about 30 minutes for my uh, for my keynote. I'm going to I'm going to keep keep it so we're trying to keep it about 20, 25 minutes at the most. Because I really am hoping that I can get some questions, um, some really tough questions, especially from from all the uh, the introverted, shy engineers that actually are, are sitting in their seats and they have really great questions to ask and are, and are kind of afraid to. So those are the people I really want to get questions from. Um, you know, for a long time now, um, Paul and the whole Vulcan team has been has been taking on and addressing. Um, some of the toughest challenges of our time. Uh, every, you know, these, the, what he calls the hardest problems, brain science, um, artificial intelligence, trying to invent smart cities of the future. And then, you know, and then recently, uh, infectious disease would be the whole bullet. And space access is another one of those really, really tough problems. Uh, it's been, it's, it's, uh, and there's lots of folks, it's an exciting time now, there's lots of folks that are, that are uh, investing in it and, in, in, in doing all kinds of interesting approaches. We just saw the, the video of those Blue Origins work, which is amazing and brilliant, and, and we as a nation are very proud of it. Um, when we get called out on space company, he provided acquisition and technical oversight of a $90 billion space portfolio restructuring space launch acquisitions to ensure a more competitive and commer commercially viable industry while overseeing the acquisition of restructuring of the GPS and communication satellite architectures to ensure future operating stability. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Charles Mears. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and I just uh, just want to say good morning to, to everybody and welcome to Seattle, the, the 21st century hub of innovation. I think it's, uh, I moved here uh, coming up on three years ago, and, uh, and the thing that has struck me the most about Seattle is the most surprising, I had no idea what a, what a, you know, Incredibly deep entrepreneurial, innovative culture we have here at Seattle. I've, I've, I've just fallen in love with it. I mean, it's everything from tech, obviously, that people are familiar with, Microsoft and everybody else, um, retail. You know, I mean, obviously, Amazon's huge. 
But remember that if Nordstrom's came here, right? And Nordstrom's has reinvented retail and continues to do that as well. And, and so it, it's a fascinating music culture. And, and now, Sort of here, and sort of not. I'll just stay here. So, uh, Charles Beans. I'm so happy to introduce him because he graduated in the same field that I am pursuing at the moment. Uh, after graduating from the U.S. Air Force Academy with degrees in engineering, mechanics, and material science, then earning a master's degree from John Hopkins University in mechanical engineering and another master's degree from the National War College in National Security Strategy, Charles Beans flipped his talents to work for 30 years within the new space industry. Before coming to Seattle, 